Okay, we're looking at Unit 2, Lecture 2, and this will be for the Unit 2 to homework. Uh, we want to recall that for any random phenomenon, you have a trial. Each trial can, uh, generates an outcome. An event is any set or collection of all your possible outcomes. And the or is a set or collection of outcomes, and the collection of all possible outcomes is called the sample space. So the first three rules for working with probability is to make a picture, make a picture, make a picture. Uh, the most common kind of picture to make is called a Venn diagram. You may have seen these in high school or another math class. So remember last time we talked about the general addition rule. But this only worked when the two events were disjoint. There was no overlap. They had nothing in common. When that was true, the probability of A or B was just equal to the probability of A plus the probability of B. B. But when our events are not disjoint, this earlier addition rule will double count the probability of both an A and B occurring. So we need what we call the general addition rule. So here's a Venn diagram. If you have an event B and an event A, and they have some overlap, then in order to find the probability of A or B, you have to look at the probability of A plus the probability of B and then subtract out the overlap. Let's look at an example. Since real estate ads suggest that 64% of the homes for sale have garages, 21% have swing pools, and 17% have both. So we would like to draw a Venn diagram to demonstrate this situation. So let's make a circle and another circle, one for pools and one for garages. So that'll be our garage circle and that's our pool circle. Now the big full circle for garages is 64% and the full circle for pools is 21%. Now we know that 17% have both so let's start by plugging that part in. Now if you've already accounted for 17% of your big pool circle the remainder will be the 21% minus the 7% or just 4%. And the same is true here for the garages. You've already accounted for 17%, so you need to do 64% minus the 17% to find out what, what number, what percentage of the homes or probability that a home has just a, a garage and not a pool. So if you compute that, you get 0.47, and then you can find the comp the number that of homes that have just a pool and not a garage, which is kind of unusual. So that's why you got 0.04. Okay. Let's go on to the next one. Now an advertisement for a statistics text suggests that 75% come with CD with statistical tools, 37% have online help, and 21% have both aids. What we're going to do is draw a Venn diagram to illustrate this. You always put the both in first. Now to figure out just online, you'll do 37% um, take away the 22% to get, um, oh, and sorry, and then to figure out only CDs, you're going to do the 75% take away 22% to get the 0.53. That order was a little off there. Okay, so that's completing that Venn diagram. Now we can answer some questions about this. It says, find the probability that a randomly selected statistic test has CD or online help. Okay. Well, that is just a CD, just online, or both. So you can use the Venn diagram and just add those areas together. But you could also have used the general addition rule, which is where you would have said, all right, the probability of a CD was a 0.75 plus the probability of those online, which was 0.37, minus the overlap, which was 0.22. See how you get the same answer if you use the general addition rule. Now it says find the probability that a randomly selected statistic test has either has neither the CD nor the online help. Okay. Well, that's all the stuff outside. Remember the entire sample space, the probability of the entire sample space has to add up to one. So you would do one minus the sum of this, which is what we call the complement of the entire Venn diagram. So it's one minus the probability of CD online or both. 1 minus the 0.9, which is 0.1. And then the probability that a randomly selected statistic text has a CD but not online help, that's obvious looking at my diagram, just the 0.53. Okay, so now we're going to move on to what's called 
um, conditional probability, and this is where you have some information that changes the probability. So you have what's called a given event. So when we want the probability of an event from a conditional distribution, we write the probability of B given A and pronounce it the probability of B given A. The probability that takes into account a given condition is called conditional probability. To find the probability of the event B given the event A, we restrict our attention to the outcomes in A. We then find the fraction of those outcomes B that also occurred. And so from a Venn diagram perspective, you can say, all right, I've got A, A, right? This is A. And then I have another event, B. And this overlap here is A and B. So if I want to find the probability of the event B given the event A, so I already know we're in A. So the denominator of my probability is just A itself, which is just the probability of A. And the numerator is just the probability of A and B, or this little piece right in here. So you can kind of visualize it. It's this part out of the total A. So because we're restricting our attention to the outcomes in A. And obviously A cannot equal zero since we know that it occurred. So in real estate ads, 64% of the homes have for sale have garages, 21% have a swimming pools, and 17% have both. It says, if a home for sale has a garage, what's the probability that it has a pool too? So we can use the conditional probability rule that B given A is equal to the probability of A and B divided by the probability of A. So the probability of a pool and a garage and that will be divided by the probability that it has a garage. So we were told that the overlap is 0.17. We divide by the probability that it has a garage to get the answer. You could have looked at this in the Venn diagram. Here is the probability that they have both. And so that's the probability of a pool given that it has a garage. That's this number. And you're going to divide it by this whole circle right here. So you're doing a little circle divided by the whole circle, which was the 0.64. All right, now, the general multiplication rule works when your events are independent. Um, but if you have the dependents, uh, we need, I mean, sorry, the multiplication rule, just the plain, the one that we looked at just a, a little while ago, assumed that our events were independent. But um, we can come up with a general multiplication rule when your events are not independent, just kind of by looking at that formula that we just looked at. The probability of A and B you could cross multiply here. You can multiply both sides by the probability of A, right, on both sides if you did that. And you did on this side too, probability of A. And then you would see that the probability of A and B is equal to the probability of A times the probability of B given A. Sorry, that's kind of messy. And that is what we call the general multiplication rule. The probability of A and B is equal to the probability of A times the probability of B given A. Now, if the events are independent, then the probability of B given A is just going to be equal to the probability of B. That's not always the case, but if that were the case. Okay. Now, um, suppose 80% of the kids who visit the doctor have a fever, and 40% of the kids with a fever have a sore throat. So, given that they have a fever, they also have a sore throat. What's the probability that a, a kid who goes to the doctor has a fever and a sore throat? Well, you're just going to multiply the probability of A, which in this case is a fever, times the probability of a sore throat, given that they have a fever, and you do 0.8 times 0.4, which is 0.32, and, um, and that's how you would work a problem like that. Okay, so we can also look at this um, dependence with a sampling with replacement, and this is kind of a common problem. Um, we often sample without replacement, which doesn't matter too much when you're dealing with a really large population. But if you're drawing from a small population, you need to think about that and, and adjust your probabilities accordingly. So drawing without replacement is just another instance of working with conditional probability. So let's come up with what we call the battery problem. So you have a junk box in your room and it contains a dozen old batteries, five of which are totally dead. You start picking batteries one at a time and testing them. Find the following probability. The first two you choose are both good. Okay, let's see. So the first one's good. Well, if there's five totally dead, 
then there must be 7 that are good. So the, for the first one to be good, that's 7 out of 12 is the chances that that first one's good. Now the second battery that you pull out, there's only going to be 11 batteries left in the box and there are only going to be 6 of those are going to be good because you already grabbed a good one. So the probability that the first two are good is 7 out of 12 times 6 out of 11, which is just that 0 0.318. What about at least one of the first three works? Now, as we're doing this assignment and some of the future ones, this wording, at least one, you really want to pay attention to it, and you want to use that language, you want to use the complement rule when you see that. So at least one of the first three works, the complement of that is that none of them worked. Finding none of them working is easier than finding at least one of the first three working because, I mean, first, because it could be that the first one works and the second two don't, or the second one works and the middle, two, the first and the last don't, or the last one works, and you have to add all those probabilities up, so that's kind of tedious. So it's better to look at it as one minus the probability that they're all bad. And the probability that they're all bad would be the first one was bad, which is 5 out of 12. Now the second one is bad given that the first was bad, that's 4 out of 11. And the third one is bad given that the first two were bad. Now you only have three bad left out of the ten batteries that you have. So you have to do one minus and then that product to get the point nine five five. Now it says, a junk box in your room contains a dozen old batteries, five of which are totally dead. You start picking batteries one at a time and testing them. Find the probabilities. The first four you pick all work. Okay, so that's going to have to be work, 7 out of 12, 6 out of 11, See, this one works, and then now this one has to work, so you have to reduce it. And, the, and then the third one works. Well, if the first two work, then you only have five that work left in there out of the ten that are in the box, and then four out of nine. Multiply those together to get your answer. You have to pick five batteries in order to find one that works. That sounds like something that would happen to me. So you have a bad one, a bad one, a bad one, a bad one. It's like a Michael Jackson song. I'm bad. I'm bad. You have four bad, and then finally you get a good one. Let's see how that would work. Okay, so the first one is bad. There were five bad ones, so five out of 12, and then four out of 11, then three out of 10, then two out of nine, then finally you still have seven good ones left in there out of the eight that remain in there. You can type that in onto either a calculator or in your, into your Excel, and you get the um, point zero zero nine. All right, so now we're going to move on to this idea of a random variable. A random variable assumes a value based on the outcome of a random event. So we use the capital letter like X to denote a random variable, and the particular, a particular value of the random variable will be denoted with a lowercase letter. In this case, we call it the little x. So it's easier with an example. Say you have a situation where you have a litter of seven kitties and three are female, and you want to consider picking two at random. So this is like your situation. So first you want to describe um, a random variable, and they just came up with one. In this situation, a random variable could be the number of male kittens you can get. All right, well, in this case, there's actual values, discrete numbers, that could happen for big X. It could be that you get no male kittens, or you get one male kitten, or you get two male kittens, depending on the selection, the random selection out of the box. So a probability model for a random variable consists of the collection of all possible values of the random variable, so that was the 0, the 1, and the 2, and then the corresponding probability that the values occur. So what's the probability that you get no males? What's the probability that you get one male? What's the probability that you get two males? And then what we want to do is find the expected value, which is the mean of the population. The expected value and mean are the same thing, and they mean on, on average, in the long run, how many male kittens can you expect to occur? So what you have to take into account is the probability that you would get one of those particular numbers, either the zero, the one, and the two, and you kind of weight that times the, the number itself to see um, how many you can expect. All right, so let's consider our probabilities. So seven kittens, three are female, pick it, two kittens at random, create a probability model for the number of male kittens you get. So the, what is the probability that you get no males? Well, you would have to get a female, and then the second one would have to be a female, given that the first one was a female. So there were three females, so that's going to be three out of seven, times now there's only two females left in the box, so two out of the six cats that are left. Then you can just multiply these. Three times two is six, seven times six is 42, so that's six out of 42. 
the probability that you got one male is going to be the probability that you got a female times the probability that you got a male. So this probability of one male is actually kind of tricky because there's two ways that it could occur. It could be the first cat that you draw out is a male and then the second one is a female. But it could also be, and this would be disjoint, is that you first grab a, a, um, a male and then a female. Or you could grab a female and then a male. Those have to be considered separately and their, um, their probabilities have to be added together. So the probability that you first grab a female is 3 out of 7. The probability that you would then grab a male would be 4 out of 6. Now, if you did it the other way, you got a male first, that's 4 out of 7, and then a female is 3 out of 6. You need to add those two numbers together. When you multiply fractions, 3 times 4 is 12, 7 times 6 is 42. So this is 12 out of 42. This one's also 12 out of 42. When we add fractions, we just add the numerators if the denominators are the same. So that's 24 out of 42. Now, probability of two males is actually pretty easy. Uh, there were three females, so four males, so four out of seven, and then three out of six. So that's 12 out of 42. Now, what I want you to notice is that these probabilities add together to make the, um, to make the, the sum of one. If you add these probabilities together, six and 12 is 18, 18 and 24 is 42. It is 42 out of 42. A proper probability model the, all the probabilities add to 1. So let's notice that the sum of the probabilities is 1. Okay, to find the expected value, what you do is you multiply the random variable times its corresponding probability and then you add them up. And so what you're doing is you're kind of weighting it. Like if we look back at this, there's a 6 out of 42 chance that you'll get none. So we're going to give 0 a weight of 6 out of 42. And then we're going to get 1, a weight of 24 out of 42, and we'll give 2, a weight of 12 out of 42. And then when we add those up, we'll, it'll tell us the, the numbers will each kind of have their varying um, weights, and so we'll have a, a sense of what we can expect. Um, and always be sure that every possible outcome is included in the, in the sum, and verify that you have a valid probability model to start with. Now, the time of standard deviation is a little bit trickier, but you remember when we found the deviation, standard deviation um, of di just using data, what we did is we did the data value minus the mean, and then we squared it. Well, we're going to do the same thing here. We're going to do the x, which is either 0, 1, or 2, minus the mean, but using the method we just calculated. Then we're going to square that. Then we're going to multiply that by its corresponding probability. We're going to add all of those up. That's going to give you the variance. And then the standard deviation is going to be the square root of all of that. So it's not actually that tricky because in Excel, you can once you find the mean, you can, you can write a command in a column to do this. And then um, you can write a command in a column that does these two things, takes the product, and then you can sum them, and then you can take the square root. So you can do it all in Excel. So um, here's how we did it in Excel. Um, we found this, this number right here is a 6 out of 42, and this 24 out of 42, and this is the, um, the other value, I forgot what it was. And then the probability of x times p of x, all I did was I took this cell and multiplied it by, or sorry, I took what was in this cell and multiplied it by this cell, and I, and I placed those there. And then, to find the DD, and then to find the expected value, I just added up this column right here. That's your expected value. Now, in order to find um, these values, you're going to take x, which is either 0, 1, or 2, and subtract the mean, and then you square it. And you have to do that each time, so you're going to want to make the mean an absolute reference. Then, to get, uh, you'll take this cell, the, these, this column, and you'll multiply it by the corresponding probability, which is this column. So you're going to do this one times this one, and you um, find those corresponding values. And then to find the standard deviation, you do the square root of the sum in this column. Okay? And I have a, another video where I show you that uh, separately, but the program was not working too well. So and there is a homework help if you need more help with the Excel on how, how to do this. Uh, one of the homework help problems walks you through that.